Um, okay, so uh, before we get into our new topic, I want to go over projects just a little bit. Um, so projects will ramp up when we come back after the full break on October uh, 18, which is the Wednesday um, after the full break is when we are going to meet here in person, in class, and kind of uh, do our project proposals. I mean, you are going to do them, write them together with your teammates, and I will be around to, to help out and give feedback. Um, but before we actually do this, you'll need to form teams. I want you to have teams of exactly two. Uh, teams of one are not possible, because then there will be too many teams, and I do not have alone possibility of handling that many teams. Uh, if you would like to be a team of three, of three, then let me know why that's necessary. What kind of work are you trying to do that needs three people? Um, I made this form where you can either inform me that you have made a team with someone else, which would be great an ideal case. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have anyone in mind that you can team up with, then uh, in this form, you can write up, write a little bit about what your interests are. And then uh, on October 15, which is uh, Sunday before um, or before we come back from the full break, I will look at everyone who doesn't have a team yet. And now we'll assign people in pairs to pairs based on what you said your interests are. So I think it's better if you figure out someone, you know, you find someone to work with um, instead of me randomly pairing you, not fully randomly, but, you know, based on those interests. Uh, so I recommend trying to fill this form by informing me about your team. And um, if not, I will, I will pair you with someone. If you have any issue about this, be it like you really don't want to pair with anyone because maybe you are working with you on something that's a digression of your PhD project and your PhD project, I don't know, involves certain sensitive data or something. Those are situations we can accommodate. So uh, let me know if there is any concerns uh, about this. Um, so yeah, when we come back, we will have this uh, proposal writing. And one thing that might be different uh, about this project relative to other projects in other classes is that it's condensed into one month. So when we write this proposal, you'll need to have a concrete idea of how you are going to evaluate it. And you will need to um, have certain measures you're going to report after two weeks. Um, I designed those homeworks to kind of prepare you for training models and trying some of the explainability methods and envisioning what kind of issues you might encounter. So uh, with that preparation, you are already set with you know, tra training a model and doing, um, applying some explainability methods, method into it. That's now possible. Um, I recommend that you also check out this document that I've prepared. You are basically going to fill in uh, these questions for your proposal. So that's, that's what's going to be your proposal uh, in the end. And the structure of this template is such that you really make a concrete plan that the, that's then you know feasible in a, in a one month, basically. Um, another thing that might be different is that uh, because we are working with explanations and we often introduce explanations because we say they are going to be helpful to someone. Um, when we come back, all we are going to talk about is how we should then conduct these evaluations and that test whether those motivations are really, whether our explanations really fulfill those ex, uh, motivations. So if you say, oh, I deem that someone will debug their code better, then you do evaluation with and without explanations and compare to groups uh, and see whether the group with explanations had indeed debugged their code better. This is just an example. So on November 22, we will have a session where here we will have peer studies. So you will do some annotations for your peers and your peers will do some annotations for you. So in the end, you will have the ability to report some number um, that quantifies whether your explanations have succeeded in whatever motivation you have, um, for whatever motivation you have introduced them for. There might be projects where you don't really introduce explainability for uh, other people, maybe you are you deem that certain explanation will improve the model, and that's not where we need people for evaluation. That's allowed and totally legit. 
Um, I might have some other ideas of what you will do instead of this user study, because then you certainly have less to do on November 20, 22nd. So um, yeah, don't be constrained with projects that really need human evaluation, write whatever in your proposal you really want to do. And I will let you know if I deem that you need to do something extra to be fair to your uh, colleagues. Okay, any questions about this? All right, I think things will become, uh, will be clearer and clearer as we uh, go. Let me try to go into the screen. Okay, great. Okay, since there are no questions, let's then move forward. And today we came to our final explainability method. And so far we have, we were talking about methods that answer why did uh, the model make this prediction. And this is a, a point where we are going to slightly switch from why to, uh, to a slightly different uh, question. Um, and to motivate all of that, I'm going to go all the way back and you probably don't even remember this example, but I brought it up when we had the first um, overview lecture where I showed you this uh, example of someone posting something on a social media feed. And I said, imagine there is a neural network behind that classifies Facebook posts or whatever social media posts as truthful or not. And I said that this uh, model had uh, uh, correctly predicted that this example here is uh, misleading. And then we talked about uh, uh, explanations even in plain English, namely pretext explanations and how they can explain someone why this post is misleading. But now we are thinking about person who had posted this uh, originally, and they, upon seeing that their post is misleading, might be confused. Maybe they didn't want to intentionally share untruthful information, and they might wonder, okay, what would I need to make with my post to make it factually correct? So what would be helpful to this hypothetical uh, person is that we show them an edit of their post that uh, then makes the model predict that this is a uh, a truthful and factually correct post instead of a misleading post. Um, and if you remember when we talked about free text explanation, the reason why this wasn't really factually correct was because it wasn't really uh, super precise in terms of the qualifiers a person needs to have to have this card. So it's not any citizen, any American citizen over 65. It's someone who has private health insurance with Medicare, Advantage Plan, lives in certain geographical area and is unfortunately uh, chronically ill. So if we had showed this, what we call contrasted edit, edit of the input example that changes model prediction from whatever was predicted to another label we want, contrast label, that's called contrastive edit. And contrastive edit is just one uh, type of, con uh, uh, one, uh, type of explanations of the type contrastive explanations and contrastive explanations in general explain how to minimally modify, uh, excuse me, uh, this is incorrect. This is contrastive edits. Contrastive explanations, um, maybe I have later on definition here, are explanations that are responses to YP rather than Q or what changes to the input would hypothetically change the answer from P to Q. And today we will see contrastive edits that I have illustrated with that example, but also another type of contrastive explanation that doesn't work with the input space, but rather uh, with representations kind of similar to, to let's say, TCAVs. Um, I had another example here, um, not maybe super um, different, uh, but here we have a clinical node and we have a network that says, okay, this person does not need to be admitted to a hospital. And then if we are, if this person, if the patient asks, why am I sent home? Um, then if we are answering why, uh, why label sent home, we will give all the reasons such as headache, dementia, no cardiovascular problems. But what people actually ask is why were I not sent home rather than uh, why, why am I sent home rather than admitted to a hospital? So you're looking actually for, for phrases in this clinical note 
that differentiates sending home versus admitting to a hospital. And here, the main difference is that there were no cardiovascular problems. If there were, then together with all of these other things, this would be a more, more serious case. And this can be, again, shown through a contrastive edit where we can show this person uh, this edit where we omit the negation and then say if this um, if if there was no word not then we would uh, you know um, admit you to the hospital. Okay, and um, so one one question you might have in mind is um, okay, people are expecting explanations that are, even when we don't explicitly ask contrastive explanations, we do seek contrastive explanations. And the way we are explaining is very underspecified, specified in a sense that we do not provide the whole causal chain to everything we explain, rather we provide that difference maker. I think that must happen for the contrafactual case to not happen. So you might wonder, okay, people, you know, explain the way they explain, why do we care and wish to present explanations of the model's decisions in a way that human like? And the reason is that, is that people assign human-like traits to AI models. So we are anthropomorphizing uh, models. So because when we, we see this tool as a kind of, like people when we are, for example, engaging with uh, ChatGPT, then we expect that these models are behaving in the same way that people are behaving. Although we might totally be aware that they are tools and that we are talking to tools, we still want, we still have expectations that they should engage in that human-like way. So if you are, for example, asking ChatGPT why, and it gives you all these very elaborate and long explanation, including every single causal chain, you might be confused because you are actually asking not why, but why this rather than something uh, something else. So this kind of contrastive explanations are really helping people to understand what's going on and therefore people get more agency from, um, from models that provide these kinds of explanations. Okay, and you know, um, in 2020, this kind of this this um, arguments that I just laid out have been recognized in the NLP community, and then this um, there is a surge of these uh, contrastive methods, but they were not all the same. They all started with this um, by say, citing uh, Miller's overview of explanations from social science, which is this paper that I have cited here which is an excellent paper. I strongly recommend reading it. Um, any, any work that starts with, okay, we should align more our explanations to be understandable to people will cite uh, Miller's work. It's it's super important one. Um, so they all start with citing Miller's uh, framework of explanations from social sci sciences, but then they end up having very difficult, different technical uh, proposals. So I want to go over this categorization and then go in depth of two of these. But uh, before I do that, are there any questions? No water. OK. All right, so we have at least uh, last time I did this, uh, I, I checked. There were a few, few ways to go about showing why the model predicted uh, one label instead of another label. Um, we'll talk in depth about contrastive editing and contrastive vector representation. So I will skip these two here and just talk about these in the middle. Um, so one way to do this is actually bindling on contrastive edits where you find those edits uh, that I have shown you, but you also have an extra layer of uh, verbalizing those contrastive edits as free text explanations. So, um, for example, you know, when I read this example here, there this is an edit, but then what I told you is a verbalization of that contrastive edit, where I told you it's not any American over 65, it's uh, we need to qualify more. I added a few more words to make it more, a little bit more coherent. So that's, an, that's one thing people have done. 
And then there is a uh, te template-based uh, inf uh, infilling where people collect these contrastive explanations that produce some templates out of them. And then they ask a model to predict the label and fill in those uh, templates. So there is this template-like uh, way to approaching these uh, contrastive explanations. Um, if you go to my slides, I have more details about these methods in the middle. So you can, I, I just skip them, but you can check them out if you are interested in more. But we'll go into uh, contrastive vector representation. So in this approach, y, p, and not q, um, and I'm not, not using this terminology just to make it my life of explaining all of this uh, easier, but very often p will be called fact and q will be called foil. So if you see that, uh, just know that that's p and q on the slides. And uh, Jacobi and Tal had approached this um, um, producing contrastive explanations by selecting latent contrasting features in the space of hidden representations instead of selecting them in the input like I have shown you with example on the social media post. So yeah, there are a few things here. First of all, what are the features in the paper? They say this can be anything. This can be, you know, inputs, uh, input highlights like we have seen with the gradient based input attribution. This could be concepts like we have seen in uh, TCAV, or it, they can be even influential examples we have seen with influence functions. They say that their framework allows these factors to be anything we want. But I recommend for this lecture to think about uh, either input features or concepts that we have seen with TCAV. When they say latent, and you will see this in NLP uh, papers a lot. That just means, okay, we are working with the uh, deep hidden representation of the input. And now we have a vector representation of the input that's not interpretable. And yeah, we will sometimes call it uh, whatever features are captured by those representations as latent. I think this is, sounds way fancier than you know what we are actually going to do. The point here is that we are finding the some kind of features in these hidden representations that uh, differentiate two classes rather than finding ways to modify input to flip our prediction from the original to uh, to whatever contrast case we are interested in. So for illustration, I want to remind you of abstract data shortcuts of features. Um, we talked about um, Data, uh, uh, data shortcuts or artifacts being these spurious color relations that are learned uh, because our annotators have introduced systematic gaps and these features, these are not representative of how people would go about solving this task. And one of them was in NLI. Again, NLI, natural language inference, is a task of predicting a relationship between two sentences. One sentence is called premise, the other one is called hypothesis. And uh, you need to predict whether the hypothesis is entailed, contradicted, or neutral with respect to the premises. And we have said that there is these kinds of abstract data shortcuts. And one of them is the lexical overlap between premise and hypothesis in NLI. If there are many words that are shared between premise and hypothesis in this data set, this would be likely an entailment case where, where that's not new in, in actually necessarily uh, the case with natural entailment cases in the world. Okay, so, um, all right, uh, we have this thesis that we are predicting, our model is predicting entailment because of a high lexical overlap between the premise and hypothesis. And we deem this is specific to, the, to predicting entailment, not to other classes, namely contradiction and neutral. So this feature, high lexical overlap between premise and hypothesis, which is something more like a concept, right? Um, because it's a higher level feature of input, uh, we deem that this is specific to, to entailment. This is a contrastive feature. Um, okay, so uh, in this paper, they use the terminology causal intervention, and that's a little bit too, I would say, too strong because we have learned throughout this course that faithfulness guarantees are very hard. So causality implies very strict faithfulness. 
what I mean by causal, those are features that answer YP. And those are all the things we have been talking about so far. So uh, we can study how model logits change by removing all features in the hidden representation indicative of the overlap concept. And then if these logits change a lot, we can say overlap concept was important for the entailment class. However, this doesn't answer if uh, these features differentiate entailment from uh, the, let's say, uh, contradiction or neutral class. Uh, it could be the case they are important for the entailment class, but they are also important for the contradiction class. Um, um, we can imagine, especially with language, that certain properties are shared amongst uh, classes. So, uh, Answering, finding these features that will cause the model outputs to change a lot answers YP to some extent, but doesn't answer whether those features are specific to one class and not the other. So contrastive intervention is answering YP or, and not Q, Y entailment and not uh, contradiction. And in this paper by Jacobi et al, they, uh, to, to answer this question, they propose to project a hidden representation to a space of contrastive features that is removed from our hidden representation of the input, all features that the model does not use to differentiate two classes. So what you end up in that vector after you have projected it to the contrastive, uh, to the space of contrastive feature includes only features uh, that differentiate P from Q. Um, now that you have that vector where we have only features that differentiate two classes, uh, you can use that vector to make a prediction and then you can study how the model logits have changed relative to logits you got when you use the original hidden representation. And then if there is a big change for predicting entailment, if you have used the features where we have only features that differentiate P from Q, you can say this was an important, these were important features to predicting P, but not Q. Okay, so let's make all of that a little bit uh, more concrete. So we'll have our function of the, and our neural network, which will be um, some weight matrix time hidden representation. Remember when we had BERT, we had here, hidden representation of the CLS token. And then we multiply it with um, some weight matrix whose number of columns was the uh, number of classes we had. Um, then uh, we have our softmax applied to this, which normalizes model probabilities and uh, will denote with Y star model prediction and with Y prime contrast label. And remember, our goal is to do this uh, projection to the space of contrastive features. So this is what we are going to now uh, make more concrete and more formal with, uh, with math. Um, so what do we have here? We have our uh, matrix, output matrix uh, W, and we have its i row. Um, when you, I didn't set up my iPad here, but uh, when you are multiplying your weight matrix with your vector, and then you will get the vector of the size uh, of the number of classes you have. And let's say in the first um, position of that logit vector, you obtain it by multiplying your first row of your output weight matrix with W with the hidden representation. You get the second value in your logit vector by multiplying the second row of your um, weight matrix with the hidden representation third and so on, you know. So um, this i row represents i class basically. Um, so we can define vector u that, um, that uh, takes the row in our ma output matrix associated with our class i star, which is the model prediction, let's say entailment, and we can take the row uh, I prime, which is associated with our contrast label. And we can take their difference. And this difference is uh, the direction that differentiates these two classes. 
So now, uh, if we are want to, if you are looking when the probability of our original class, let's say entailment, is higher than some other class, let's say contradiction, this will be true if and, and only if when we uh, multiply this vector u with our hidden representation is uh, equal than uh, than a zero. And th this is quite quite simple uh, to derive just by using what the definition of P is and the fact that um, these these uh, vectors are just a row in our output matrix. Okay, so um, from this, they then derive the um, the con contrastive um, projection which is the projection of our hidden representation of our normal input with that we didn't do anything to, to this, uh, uh, to this space that's defined by our vector u that differentiates these two classes. So this is a projection matrix. This is the, you know, the formula to, for making a, a projection of a vector to a certain vector space that's spanned by a, uh, u. Um, and all you are doing is projecting your vector onto u, and uh, u is a set is a is a direction of the of the space that differentiates uh, our two classes. So what happens when we do that is that we got we get this vector, and this vector captures latent features of our uh, imp representation that we uh, that we initially had which are used by the model to differentiate the, these two classes. Okay, is that somewhat clear? Okay, so um, before we now, before I tell you what are we going to do with these contrastive features, I want to also introduce what they call causal attribution. And they have three options for that. One is replace certain tokens with the mask token. So remember with NLI, I told you that annotators have introduced this bias where um, every time they had to produce a contradiction, uh, a hypothesis that contradicts the premise and premise uh, included word dogs, they would uh, replace word dogs with cats. And now cats are spurious features to the class contradiction. And if you want to test that, uh, you can remove all the occurrences of the word cats in all hypotheses, and then check how the model prediction changes if the model had predicted contradiction. And if your hypothesis uh, that these features were important was really true, then you would see a notable change. So you can do that. Um, another technique they employ is called amnesic probing. Amnesic probing removes a concept from a representation. So again, if we have our sentence, we will represent it with the uh, final representation of the CLS token. From that representation, we will do a null space projection that iteratively removes all linear correlations uh, with the concept until it is impossible to discover the concept information from whatever is left in our representation. And this is a null space projection, um, iterative null space projection um, is uh, introduced in, uh, in this paper. So um, this is just a way to do something like this, but when you have something that's not uh, easily you know, detectable in your inputs. So when you have a concept, concept is a higher level feature of the input. And in, it is not necessarily the case that you can remove certain words in the input to capture that concept because it's something extra to the, to the input. So you would deploy a, a technique uh, like this to actually remove it from the uh, representation. Uh, there is a follow-up work to amnesic probing. Um, that uh, is checking that these uh, that we are removing all nonlinear directions, and that's one of those that I have sent you when we were discussing TCAF scores in Zoom chat. Um, I think it's called kernel something projection. I will find it again. So yeah, just have in mind that there are follow-ups to these works that are even more uh, robust. 
And one thing that's quick to know about amnesic probing is that um, it is the first work that showed that your certain information, certain concept can be captured in the representation, but it's not necessarily used by the model. So it can be there, but it can be ignored. And, um, and it is the first work that have shown that if we are going to use these probing techniques that we really need to also report whether these representations are being uh, used. Namely, if you had removed them, uh, if nothing has changed, then that's an, that's an issue. Then it means they were just captured, but not really used. Um, again, as the CAV scores requires positive examples uh, to, to do this, and final option is to just have manually crafted contrafactuals. Uh, there is a line of work that develops contrast sets, for example, where you make these uh, contrastive instances to check whether models can, are they robust when you are close to the decision boundary. Okay, so now we have a way to measure YP, causal attribution. We have find a way to make contrastive attribution, uh, project our representation to a space that uh, captures only features that rep uh, differentiate P and Q. And finally, what they do is they first apply causal intervention. And then that means they are um, they have their original instance and then they apply some uh, causal intervention to it. And that this could be for simplicity, I think uh, the one where we add mass tokens is the is the is the simplest one. And then on these we will follow, we will contrastive intervention. And the reason why they are having this extra step of um, contrastive uh, intervention is to attribute contrastive behavior to a subset of causal factors uh, discovered in the first step. So there, there will be factors that are causally, um, causally related to the prediction, but some of them will be um, uh, exhibit contrastive behavior. So what they end up measuring is the, is the following. So here you have with X prime um, a, uh, an input with an intervention. And so age X prime can be either here, um, it can be um, either representation you get after amnesic probing, or it can be a representation you get out of your um, transformer that you fed the instance where some tokens were masked. So it can be either of these things, it can be uh, the third option as well, where you give your manually crafted contrafactual uh, to the input and then take the representation of that whole input. Um, so that's AGX prime, you get your Q, um, excuse me, that's not AGX prime. AGX prime is first you do what I have just said, and then you do the contrastive uh, projection, which is defined with uh, with this procedure. And then in the end, you are going to measure the difference in your um, model logits, normalized model logits, but here they also have this normalization to be, um, for example, if we had third class and now uh, the relative uh, difference with respect to the sum of these is, is a kind of uh, change that uh, wouldn't be captured if we just took the difference of these uh, two. And this in the end measures the uh, contrastive uh, behavior where higher value indicates uh, that uh, the, the higher, uh, higher contrastive behavior. Okay, so with, uh, maybe we can put everything together with the, uh, I didn't write it down, but with uh, the overlap, um, Concept. So with overlap concept, we because it's a higher level feature of the input, we will probably use amnesic probing. And uh, that will give us representation of the input where um, these features related to the overlap concept are erased. And then we would do extra step of doing the contrastive projection using this equation over here. Uh, and then we will measure what is the probability of the uh, contrast class with that, uh, both contrast class and the original class with this completely changed representation. 
and we will compare it to what we have uh, gotten uh, before. Okay, it's a little bit um, multi-step and you know um, probably mm, hard to grasp all together now immediately, um, but it's more or less putting everything we have known uh, from prior methods into this contrasted projection. So it's just uh, combining these uh, these interventions on the representations. Any questions about this? Okay, I think it would be um, interested uh, to think about how a method like this is interacting with TCA. Um, with TCA, we had the derivative of the probability of certain class with respect to a vector that captures certain concepts. Um, here as well, certain the representation we get would should measure certain concepts. So I don't know whether we would necessarily get different observations from these two methods. I don't think anyone had compared them, and I think that would be interesting to see. Um, and as well as this amnesic probing, um, I don't know whether this method can be combined with uh, TCAVs as well, because with TCAVs we are deeming that um, the method is kind of inherently faithful because it's derived from you know derivative, but we know from gradient based attribution that this can be very sensitive as well. So having um, kind of a confirmation that, yeah, these concepts that TCAV says are captured are really being used um, by using amnesic probing as a way to quantifying that would be interesting if that's possible. I'm kind of just thinking uh, out loud here. So uh, I think amnesic probing, TCAV and this contrastive um, projections all have something to, to do with each other. Um, and I don't think anyone really poked into that, so something to potentially think about further. Okay, so this was a contrastive uh, vector representation. Now we'll go into something that I think will be a little bit uh, easier to, to follow. So uh, this is uh, contrastive editing, the example we have seen in the, in the beginning, where we answer phi p and not q by uh, answering actually another question, related question, and that's how to change the answer from P to Q. And we are trying to make that by making a contrastive minimal edit. A minimal edit, uh, that's a minimal edit to the input that causes the model output to change to the contrast case and has hallmark characteristics of a human contrastive explanations uh, in that it cites contrastive features and uh, selects a few relevant cases instead of the full causal chain. So a little illustrative example um, from a task where we have a question and then her children are going to Linda's home. We are given few options and we need to answer that in the context of, dear Anne, I hope that you and your children will be here in two weeks. My husband and I will go to meet you at the train station. Our town is small. Now, based on this context, we would say that out of these four options, what is the correct answer here? There's a data shortcut here. <laughs> Come on. Trick question or is it chance? Train, <laughs> it's train. <laughs> uh, not a good question. Uh, so yeah, the answer is uh, by train. And now we are wondering um, why by train and not let's say on foot. And with contrast of editing, what we are going to do is make the edit that will change the answer from by train to on foot. So an edit like that could be, dear Anne, I hope you, that you and your children will be here in two weeks. My husband and I will go meet you at your home on foot. Our house is small. small. Now the answer would be more likely on foot, right? Because we are mentioning on foot in the context. Um, so yeah, this is how we, how we go uh, about this. And this is just an example in a 
you know, a concrete example in a task that these things are evaluated. Uh, in. in a specific method, I will go uh, go um, and explain in detail is called max. So with the contrastive editing, to ground it more into actual, you know, um, ML lingo, the goal is to explain a predictor model by automatically finding a minimal edit to the input that causes the model output to change to the contrast case. And very high level idea of MICE is to use another editor model that keep masking input words and filling them in until uh, we find an edit that changes the label predicted by predictor. So we uh, mask some tokens, we fill it in, and then we ask predictor, hey, what's the label now? And if it uh, had said that the label is our contrast label, we are happy and that's a contrastive edit. But contrastive edit has another property and that's that it has to be minimal, right? So while we are trying to find uh, edit that will flip the label, we also simultaneously are trying to minimize the uh, masking percentage, which indicates our edit size. Okay, so with a concrete example, we have a, a movie review that says uh, Sylvester Stallone has made some crap films in his life, but this has got to be one of the worst. A totally dull story, obviously a negative review. With, with mice, we are first going to uh, prepend whatever is the other contrast label we want to change this movie review's uh, prediction to. So in this case, uh, imagine that the model had predicted this is negative and now we want to flip it to positive. We are going to add three tokens, label, semicolon, and positive to the beginning. Then we're going to mask n percent of input tokens and for now, uh, ignore the exact values of n. We are going to talk about what those uh, are later. So we are going to select some portion of our input tokens and we are going to replace them by mask token. And then for at each mask composition, we are going to um, sample a 15 spans. So for example, maybe have, we have replaced the first one with good and the second one with worst and the third one with no well and so on. And then with uh, each one of these, um, we are going to predict again what the, what the label is from the same model. So we are going to have maybe that now the class for being positive is 0 0.2, 0 0.6, and so on for each one of these. And, and you know, here we already, um, for these two at least, we flipped the label uh, and now the label is positive, right? So we could say, okay, this is it. We have found an edit that flipped the label and we don't need to search anymore, but we didn't really uh, explore all the possibilities for, or few possibilities for the masking percentage n, which we could push maybe to be lower and therefore find a contrastive edit, the one that flips the label, but is also smaller uh, in size. So we are not going to do this with uh, a one value for our masking percentage. We are going to do it with four different values of the masking percentage n. And I will tell soon how exactly we get this for. So four times uh, 15, 60 samples. For those 60 samples, we are going to rank them with respect to the logic of the contrast label, which is for us positive sentiment label. And we are going to keep top three in uh, uh, samples in some beam. And then if we have found a contrastive edit here, we would be happy because although I have not said yet, we have also explored different values Often while trying to push them to be as little as possible. Uh, however, if we didn't find this, we will repeat this whole thing uh, two more rounds. And then if so after two more rounds, we don't find a contrastive edit, then this would be a failure for finding a contrastive edit for this case. Okay, is the high level approach clear? Good. So there are certain questions you might have. First of all, how do we pick our masking positions? Do we pick them randomly? And we are not going to do that. We are going to pick them based on the token importance that we are going to get from the gradient magnitude. So we are doing gradient attribution to get what are the most important tokens for predicting the original label. 
and uh, because um, gradient attribution tells us those uh, changing those words will cause the log logits to change a lot. We know that, uh, okay, it makes the most sense for us to change those words because we actually want to change the logit. So instead of taking top n percent of any, I mean, randomly taking top uh, uh, n percent of uh, tokens, we are going to take uh, top n percent of ranked tokens that are ranked with respect to their importance. Um, how are we going to pick values for n? We are going to do some binary search on, in an interval that we have found through more or less uh, hyperparameter search. So we know that uh, through initial exploration, then this data set, these edits that um, will certainly flip the label uh, usually will happen if we are very greedy and we uh, mask 50% of the word, 55% of the word. Uh, but masking 55% is way too much and we don't really want to do that. So we are going to do binary search. We are going to start with the mid midpoint, which is a, um, about 27%. And then if we have found uh, a contrastive edit with 27%, we know that, all right, at least we can get it with 27%. So let's try to be a little bit more ambitious and lower the uh, masking percentage and therefore lower the edit size, right? If we didn't get the uh, contrastive edit with 27%, maybe we were too ambitious and maybe we are thinking, okay, maybe let's try to make it a little bit higher until we actually get the contrastive edit and then maybe we'll come back and lower it once we get it. So depending on what happened in the previous step, we are going to do this again. Imagine we have uh, uh, found the contrastive, we flipped the label with 13%, then again, we can be maybe even more ambitious and increase, decrease it to uh, a 6% uh, here as well. Maybe we found it with 41% and then we are going back and trying to decrease it. And then we re repeat this um, uh, such that in the end we have, um, I think with three, three levels of binary search basically, if I remember correctly, um, that detail. So in the end, you try different values of masking percentage and you try to lower it, but you are not getting a guarantee that you find the smallest edit. And this is the limitation of this method. It, gives, it tries to minimize the uh, masking percentage and therefore the edit size, but it could be that uh, a subset of the edit you have found could also flip the label and then it would be more minimal. Uh, so definitely an opportunity for uh, improvement. And finally, uh, can this work without any additional tweaks? Um, so can we just use the model that's used here for an editor is T5, which is encoder decoder model. T5 has been pre-trained both with a mask language modeling objective, which is actually span language modeling objective, where instead of masking a single token, they mask a span and you can reconstruct the span. Uh, which is quite useful here because then we can delete, edit, and do what not. Um, but can we just use T5 off the shelf and when will it make these edits? Um, it will to some extent, but it will be way better if we tweak it for this task. So what we did here is we did a, a round of further tuning of uh, T5 as an editor, where we would take this um, in original movie review, we would mask its tokens, our spans, and then we would prepend the, the, the label here. And we knew what the original words were. So we did this uh, span, cor uh, span infilling, which was the original pre-training task of T5, but we added the label in the beginning such that the model associates label with certain words. So here negative will cause it to uh, uh, fill in more negative um, sounding words. But then later on, when we put here positive, it will start uh, putting positive words. So if you do this additional uh, step, this all works uh, better. So all in all, it is a two-stage approach to generating contrastive edits. In this first stage, you prepare your editor by doing this targeted um, 
uh, mask language modeling or spanning filling, however you like to call it. Uh, and then once you have that, you do the second step, which is the first illustration I show you, where you make edits guided with gradients and logits of the model we are exploring. Okay, so that's about the about mine. So I want to show you some results, but I'm I'm happy to clarify any any details of this that might be unclear. Yeah. So I think one of the first examples you showed you had like the word not cross. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this assume that there's some sort of thing that has to be there that like it's in the original one that you can't like, delete or additional terms? Like you just have to replace it. You can with T5, you can delete it. So you have an op you your spanning feeling can return basically nothing. Uh, so that's an option. And we do end up deleting and adding things. And adding things can be either, you know, if you had an originally one token, you can replace it with, let's say, three tokens. So uh, that, that's pretty convenient in terms of getting these edits, right? Yeah. OK, so how do we evaluate these approaches? There are three metrics to to evaluate that you are getting something that makes sense. So in this way, this would be, I guess, a group of plausibility metrics. First one is flip rate. So that's the most important one. You want to have higher flip rate. You want to have contrastive edits. For, all, for your evaluation instances, you have, want to have ability to flip the label, right? Um, and in this evaluation across three data sets, so IMDB, binary sentiment classification, news groups is uh, multi uh, has multiple classes that are about the classification of news I believe as suggested by the name of the data set and uh, raises that uh, question answering data set I have shown you with N and uh, train and uh, going on foot or, or by train so achieving high flip rate is uh, is possible uh, and the second property is edit minimality, which is much harder to, to really, it, it's quantifiable, but it's harder to compare to something. We don't have a gold standard here. So uh, these are the flip rates that, uh, excuse me, minimality that's measured with the Levenstein distance, which is the minimum number of deletions, insertions, and substitu substitutions required to transform the original to the edited instance. Um, and you know we get these results that span from 0 0.2 to uh, 0 0.35, let's say. And now is that good? It's hard to really tell. Uh, one thing we were able to do is that uh, with IMDb, uh, IMDb has a corresponding contrastive set, which is a set that my annotators, actual people, have uh, created manually by taking instances and producing minimal changes to those instances that will change positive to negative label or negative to positive instance. Um, so when we compare what is the uh, edit size of those edits that people have created, we found that the edit size of the, uh, of the mice approach is comparable. So that's the only true positive sign, I would say that this is actually uh, kind of making sense in terms of the minimality. Um, I think there are very interesting questions about minimality. So this is, we measure minimality by the edit size, uh, but I do believe that the actual, when you communicate to people, the this is not necessarily measuring the best edit size. There is some kind of pragmatical notion about the size of the edit that conveys the information to people the best. And I don't think it's necessarily the shortest one that might be the one that's sending information in the most understandable way. So, you know, when I said the the, the not, uh, there was a, an example where removing just word not would signal there was no cardiovascular problems. I think it's a question of whether just saying to people the lack of cardiovascular problems was the issue. It was the reason why we didn't deem your case uh, super seriously or just 
crossing that word might be sufficient. I don't know. I don't think anyone really explored this, but I think the question of what the right at its size might not be fully captured by just Levenstein distance. And finally, um, you also don't want your examples that you have produced, your contrastive examples to be incoherent. Uh, so you wanna measure something like fluency, where you compare the fluency of your original example relative to your edited example. So specifically here, we just take the ratio of the um, perplexity between the original and edited instance. And if that's close to one, that's good. That means that this hasn't changed notably. And uh, seemingly here, it seems that the contrastive edits that are created are not being now completely incoherent relative to the original instances. Okay, so this was all more about, are you producing what you said you wanna produce? Are you producing an edit? that flips the label, that is minimal, but also it's not completely incoherent uh, relative to the uh, original instance, because maybe I didn't emphasize this enough or said at all, actually. If you have produced something that's way uh, uh, confusing to the model, then the model flip its label, not because of the content of the edit, but because this is now out of the main uh, example. So. This, this measure is telling you that you are producing in-domain example to the model, um, so it should handle it well. And the fact that it's flipping the label comes from the actual content of the, of the edit. All right, so how can these uh, edits be used? Uh, and these are actual evaluation we care, we care about when we do explainability. And this is something we talked a little bit about when we had read the paper, so title will you find these shorts. So here we know that um, we don't actually know that our model might be using any data shortcuts. We are clueless about it. And we are checking uh, what kind of edits will change our positive prediction to negative. And in this example, we find out, oh, it's only the numerical score at the end that needs to be changed uh, to flip this prediction with from positive to negative. And this edit was found automatically by mice, not by us trying different things and then checking the model prediction. So mice shows us, okay, all you need to do is change seven out of 10 to four out of 10. And if we are person who had developed this model, we might be uh, terrified because we are training a model that should read the content of this movie review, understand its semantics, and based on all of that, um, make a prediction. Otherwise, they, whoever uh, employed us, did a bad job because we could have written a rule-based system here, right? We didn't need to train a neural network to predict this when uh, all we could do is check whether the score is higher than five and say this is uh, positive. So this is a situation we don't want and we would call this bug and finding this bug debugging in uh, AI development. So this is nice because what this enables us as developers is to say, oh, model is doing the silly thing. What I'll do to fix this is I will remove this numerical scores at the end because although they are useful signal, I actually want to force my model to read uh, the review. I will retrain my model and then uh, I will have a more robust model, for example. Um, so that's just one option. You might have other ideas about how to fix this problem. And you could, uh, so this is still just a hypothesis. We have seen maybe manually a few examples. It, it's not necessarily the case that model does this for every single uh, example with a numerical score. So we can test this uh, more, more robustly. So our hypothesis is that model learn to rely heavily on numerical ratings. So to test that, we are going to um, use MICE's edits and we are going to filter instances with edits smaller than 5%. We deem those are data shortcuts because data shortcuts by definition are those spurious correlations that are, um, you know, just a few words that are indicative of the of the label. So does mice itself go past the 
the three levels of like binary search um, percentage that you showed us? Was that mm -hmm. just an example of a mice go past that to get as small as it can? You you can set those are basically hyperparameters. You okay. can set the interval and how how much you are going to binary search are going to do uh, as you wish. The problem is the more you are doing it, um, then more expensive this all uh, is getting. So every 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 binary search uh, value is uh, requiring you to make the inference out of the model, right. which is not backpropagating. So it's not the worst possible scenario, but it's still quite a lot. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, we filter instances that have very short edit size, which are then therefore suspicious because we know that their star shortcuts are usually short. And then we are going to select tokens that are removed or inserted more than expected given their frequency in the uh, original IMDB inputs. So if we are doing that, and then here I'm showing you uh, top five tokens that um, um, whose uh, whose um, you know frequency in being in these short edits relative to their um, frequency in the training data is the highest. So for these five, for removed and these five for inserted, for flipping from negative to positive. So how to read this for? Uh, to flip from negative to positive, um, removing score of 410 or number four is a successful strategy. Or if you want to uh, flip to, if you want to add something to flip from negative to positive, a good strategy is to insert this word or number 10. Here, if you want to change from positive to negative, good strategy is to remove very high numerical scores or insert uh, lower scores. Um, so yeah, these strategies are picked on uh, disproportionately relative to their frequency in the data. And this confirms that indeed uh, the model is picking on uh, this uh, over the multiple of these instances, not just few uh, examples we picked up. And this whole procedure is actually then, uh, I don't have a citation here, but uh, I mentioned it at some point um, and it, it is in the paper, so I'll show you uh, the paper where I mentioned the abstract, this NLI um, example. This paper here is has taken that methodology we introduced and made it more general for any kind of data artifact. So basically this idea of measuring whether uh, your explainability method, be it a contrastive edit or even the gradient attribution or any kind of inter, uh, attribution, have picked on certain tokens more than it should have uh, picked it relative to this frequency of these tokens in the data is, um, is a suggestive that these are spurious correlations. Okay, so is this experiment clear? Yep, please. Uh, question on the results. So I was doing a paper about the contractual group company and they used the manager to set on like is mm -hmm. that related to fluency or is that like uh just just a lot of fluency or semantic content mm -hmm. to change it from like irony or satire, for example? That's what they were checking on the gotcha. I think it's, yeah, I don't think it's related to fluency. I think it's uh, related to the edit minimality. Okay. I think um this is my guess, so not 100% sure, but I think uh, if you're getting very high semantic similarity um, for certain tasks, you might deem that those uh, edits or whatever you have done is more minimal because the meaning hasn't changed a lot. Um, I, for, for language, this won't really work because uh, you, can have, you, you might have one expression of negation and you're removing one word will give you exactly opposite meaning. So minimal edit will be as minimal as possible, a single token, but the meaning will be completely changed. So I'm not sure whether, I mean, I don't think it has to do with fluency, yeah. but yeah, I'm not sure what the motivation was then there, if they are working with language. 
Uh, they're using large language models to generate that kind of mm -hmm. and I've seen the generation on that. Um, but they said they grabbed it from some other type of method. So it was decided I'm like, I grab and use this method because I can. Gotcha. Um, so I didn't know if that was like common. Yeah, maybe I um said too soon that it's not related to fluency. So it could be related to fluency because then if it's similar to the original, then we can say, okay, um, it's not widely different and the model should handle it. Um, yeah, it could be the whole thing to these two things, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about this uh, just a, a few minutes ago. Um, or at least I hinted that things are getting a little bit uh, computationally expensive. So here um, is the number of forward passes we need from um, our model. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to turn on my laser. Okay, so we have a certain number of binary research levels, uh, S, and we have a number of samples at each masking position M that we need to predict uh, a span for. And this is if we have only one round, but if we have more round, then for every example in our beam, and we are keeping the three examples uh, in a beam, uh, but you could keep more if you had more about computational power, then for each one of them, you are going to uh, uh, re uh, repeat this. So when I put the concrete numbers from the paper, that's 420 uh, passes, which is for a single instance, and you might have 10,000 instances you want to evaluate. So this becomes really computationally uh, ex expensive while not guaranteeing that a smaller contrastive edit uh, exists. Um, one paper followed up to this and they kind of alleviated this problem, although not to the full extent, uh, I think. Um, instead of using this binary search and gradient-based identify masking locations, they're using this method called spectra, which is a sparse attention, self-attention instead of in place of the uh, standard attention. And through this um, um, sparse attention, you are getting these uh, locations and already the sparsity uh, gives what is the minimal number of tokens you will need to replace in the input. So they use whatever sparsity level was given from them, uh, the, their attention matrix in place of uh, the masking percentage and we have uh, we were looking for through the very tedious binary search. So they avoid that. The reason why I said that I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't know whether this fully uh, kept kind of avoids this um, issue is because using another types of self-attention matrices in place of our standard attention matrices can cause some disruptions in the task performance. Um, I think they certainly use tasks that are prototypical in NLP, but I don't think that we have 100% guarantee that this now replacing uh, our standard attention matrices with this one will work everywhere. Um, otherwise, that would be the standard uh, thing we are using. So um, definitely a very neat approach to avoid this issue. Uh, I do wonder whether it is then applicable to every, every you know, any single case uh, of any kind of model we train uh, in hyperface, but definitely a method to have, have in mind. Um, yeah, and I don't, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know the details of Spectra well enough to confirm this, but I'm also not sure that this problem of guaranteeing that a smaller contrastive edit does not uh, exist is captured by their methodology. Okay, so I'll finish. Are there any questions about this one? Oh, no, this one. No, so many birds. This one. Okay, good. So ju just quickly, I will go over a few examples from uh, vision tasks. Um, so contrastive edits and contrafactuals have been a thing not only in NLP, especially when we work with manual features that are interpretable like age or income, uh, they have been properly studied. And this whole you know, line of work comes uh, from ideas uh, that are presented there. Uh, but yeah, finding how to change the input to flip the label 
in uh, spaces, input spaces that are more complex, such as uh, text or images, is way harder than if you have manual features where you can, uh, I don't know, for age, you can have 100 possibilities potentially, and you just tweak them and see how the output changes. So with vision, what you will see a lot is, first of all, they're always constrained on very, very specific tasks, such as bird classification. And then here you will take a patch of an image and replace it, try to replace it with another patch of the image. So here this uh, beak is changed with from something more orange to white, and that's indicative of another type of bird. So to change the prediction from this bird to this other bird, you would kind of uh, identify that these uh, peak feature, big feature is, is important. Um, and then uh, there are more, way more involved methods that also introduce uh, both language and vision. So here again, there is a bird classification, but they are using some kind of uh, contrastive natural language explanation, like the one here says, ring-billed gull has a bill with a black ring near the tip. And this information is combined with the actual uh, information in the image. So this feature of a bird is then uh, identified in, uh, in this uh, image. Um, yeah, and, uh, and the final example I found is, um, with uh, this action, there is a there is certain activity that's happening, um, and it says biking, not skateboarding, because posture is sitting. So you would uh, identify part of the image that hints that there is uh, one action rather than other. So I don't know details of these works. I just wanted to point out that those this also exists uh, in uh, in uh, vision, and there instead of working with changing certain texts to other spans you're changing certain parts of an image uh, to another part of the image, or you're just localizing where in the image are those features that differentiate one class from the uh, from the other. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, we can all start our whole day. Yay. <laughs> okay, thank you.